God, yea, the deep things of God and make them known to us. We know, Father, that we have an anointing from the Holy Spirit and know all things. And so we ask that you teach us the word of God this morning, Father. And we believe one plants and other waters and you give the increase. And we believe the yoke is being destroyed because of the anointing upon the word. Again, Father, help us not just to hear the word, but help us to be doers of it in Jesus' name. And all people said, Amen. Amen. We're talking about developing or discovering, excuse me, and developing your spiritual gifts. And we have been laying a foundation. I took a little longer than I wanted to on that. But this morning we're going to actually begin looking at different ministry gifts. And if you'd open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you can follow along in your notes or you can look up in the projector here as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after the miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Do all, uh, excuse me, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Now, in the context of what Paul is teaching here in 1 Corinthians, which 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 are all one long teaching about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, the body of Jesus Christ, and how we fit into that body. Paul starts out in 1 Corinthians 12 telling this bunch of, this group of believers, this church, that he doesn't want them to be ignorant concerning the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Then he goes into a long teaching on the gifts of the Spirit, which there are nine different gifts of the Spirit. There's three power gifts, three utterance gifts, and three revelatory gifts. Three gifts that that, uh, do something, three gifts that uh, reveal something, three gifts that say something. And these are manifestations of the Holy Spirit for the specific purpose of building up the body. Then Paul goes on in the rest of the chapter, and he begins to talk about uh, the body of Christ, how we are the body of Christ, and all part of one body, yet individuals within that body. And that no one particular part is any less valuable or less important to the body of Christ than another part. And so corporately, we make up the body of Christ, because corporately, we are all born of the Spirit of God. We've been made to partake of one Spirit, one baptism, one Lord, one Father of all, who is over all and above all. Amen? So when we're talking about the church, the word church literally means the called out ones. Those called out. So what are we called out of? We're called out of the world. We're called out of the darkness. We're called out of sin into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. So the church isn't a building. The church is the people. Now, we meet together in what we call the church, but this is not really technically the church. We are the church. The church is every born of God believer, every person that's been born again and has the Spirit of God living within them, and Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. And it doesn't matter what ethnicity you're of. It doesn't matter what socioeconomic position you're of. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, if you're uh, uh, no matter what. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the church is comprised of every person on this planet who has made Jesus Savior and Lord. And not only people on the planet, but all those who have gone before us and gone into heaven. All of our friends, all of our relatives, anyone on this planet, since people were on the planet, who has committed their life to Christ, been born of God, and are in heaven today, they're part of the church. So as the church, we're called to do something for God. And what we're called to do is be the body of Jesus Christ. Now, when it's, we use this term, the Bible uses the term the body of Christ. Of course, it's an illustrative, descriptive way of using and talking about the church. Because when we think of a body, the, the, the illustration that God gave us through the Apostle Paul of the body is easy to understand because all bodies have a head, right? And the head of the body of Christ, this spiritual body. We're not talking about a physical body. We're talking about a spiritual body because, again, we're spiritual beings. We are a spirit who lives in a body and possesses a soul, a mind, will, and emotion or an intellect. So we as spiritual beings are joined spiritually to the Father of spirits through Jesus Christ. So we're born of God. Every person on this planet, whether they're a Christian, whether they're saved or unsaved, are still spiritual. There are only two groups of people on this planet right now, and ever have been, those who are 
uh, children of God and those who are not children of God. Since the fall of men, that's where people are. There's those who are of God and those who are not of God. So right now, there are only two distinct groups of people that God looks at, those who are saved and those who aren't saved. Those who are his and those who aren't. Now, the good news is those who aren't can become his. And that's what God wants us to do, is to proclaim the gospel to those who are not his, those who are not saved, those who are not part of the body, so that they can come into this body and be part of the universal body of Christ and be saved. Amen. So as the body, the body, just like your physical body, has a head. What does the head do? The head directs the body. The head is a central command system of the body. And the head is the director of the body. Jesus, the head of the church, directs the body. Jesus, the head of the church, is the one that has the final authority. It is called his church. We are called the church of Christ. Amen? That's who we are. Now, in the church, we know as the universal body of Christ, that the way God designed the body to operate from the New Testament resurrection of Jesus Christ was through what we call the local church. Now, the local church started out on the day of Pentecost. It started with 3,000 people being saved on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Later, the church grew as people began to be saved. More and more people began to be saved. And what happened? Well, Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verse 20, he said, I have not only taught you publicly, but also house to house. So initially, Christians began meeting in the Jewish synagogues. That's where they began going. In the book of Acts, we see that the apostles went into the temple and broke bread and had the fellowship daily. So initially, the Christians would go into the temple and they'd worship. Because remember, all of the Christians, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, were all Jewish. There wasn't a single non-Jewish person among them. And so they were all Jewish. And so naturally, being raised Jewish, they would just continue to worship God after the traditions of their fathers, which would be Jewish. And, uh, so, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's who we are. Our roots are Jewish. Amen? But as the church began to grow and the gospel began being taken to the non-Jewish world, the non-Jewish world, the Gentile world, uh, they would come and meet together in homes. And, of course, a lot of people that met together in homes were Jews as well. So the early part of the church, people would meet together in homes. And one of the reasons for that is they were under persecution. We find in the book of Acts that Saul of Tarsus went about with letters from the Sanhedrin to arrest and put Christians in jail. So Christians couldn't wor- worship openly uh, as a general rule. It was, they were per- persecuted. And... Um, But as persecution began to decline, we see, and the church began to grow among non-Jewish believers, the church began to take on a more Gentile uh, flavor, more and more non-Jewish people. Now, these letters to these churches, the churches at Corinth, uh, the church at Corinth, uh, uh, church at Galatia, many of these people uh, in those churches were non-Jewish. And Paul is speaking to this this predominantly non-Jewish church trying to teach them about the things of God. And so God, by the Spirit of God, gives us these wonderful illustrations that we can, we can uh, live by. Now, again, as we said before, as the church began to grow, uh, we had great persecution up until about 312 when uh, Constantine uh, issued the ver- edict of tolerance where he said it is no longer... We are no longer persecuting Christians. We're no longer... Christianity is now... uh, It is now the state religion, really, is what he made it, which was not a good thing. It was good in the sense that the gospel was able to be preached, but it was a bad thing in that Constantine was not a Christian, and Constantine took all the pagan deities of the Roman sun god worship, Taoism and so on, and he brought it right into Christianity. So what Constantine did is he took all the names of the pagan gods and he put Christian names, names of saints, names of Christians who had died, and so on. And we saw within that a marriage between Christianity and the world that we haven't completely recovered from ever. However, uh, that being said, what happened is when the Edict of Tolerance was issued and Christianity was free to preach preach the gospel, then people, because of the explosion of people being saved, they began to build public places of worship and worship together in public. Because in the Old Covenant, the church, of course, what was the church? It was the congregation. And that's another word for church, congregation. So a congregation, it was the, called the congregation in the wilderness. The children of Israel were a precursor to the church of the New Testament. And so uh, they met, of course, at the tabernacle. 
Then they met at uh, uh, the temple later on. And, of course, God permitted them to build what's called synagogues, which were local-type churches, you know, local gathering for local congregations because you live too far away to go to the temple all the time, so you'd have to meet publicly in local places. And the synagogue was the epicenter of the, Christ- of the Jewish communities, and it still is today. And the synagogue worship is what the New Testament church was modeled after. It was modeled after synagogue worship. And uh, so, glory to God. And, and really, you know, we've talked a lot about the fact that we're called to be one body and unified. And a lot of what really divides us as Christians is more stylistic than biblical. It's the way we worship. There's no, you know, uh, there is no such thing in the New Testament that I can find, and you're not going to find it. Uh, there's always this this push within Christianity to try to go back to the original church. Well, we've got to go back to the book of Acts. Well, your opinion of the book of Acts and five other people's opinion of the book of Acts is probably very different. You're never going to find exactly what the book of Acts had. Now, again, what we're talking about, if we mean we need the, the simplicity of the gospel, we need the purity of the, the, the gospel, yes, we need that. We need the Holy Spirit moving, yes, we need that. We definitely need that. But... We are different people, and we have diversities, and we're looking, we're talking about 2,000 years, over 2,000 years since the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and a whole lot of persecution of Christians, a whole lot of corruption of Christianity uh, as well that came out of, you know, papal power out of Europe and, and the divine right of kings that came out of Europe. So during that time, there's been a lot of diversity within Christian circles, and, uh, you know, uh, but however, let me just go back to what I said before. All Christians agree and must agree on certain fundamental truths of Scripture. Number one, you have to agree that there is no salva- salvation and no other person than Jesus Christ. Anyone that says there's another way to heaven than Jesus is not a Christian, or they are preaching a false gospel. Paul himself said, though we are an angel from heaven, come preaching another gospel, let him be a preach, let him be a curse. And by that means, if anybody comes saying there's another way to get to heaven than Jesus Christ, may he be cursed. And one of the things that we are facing today within the world is we're constantly being pressured to accept what's called ecumenicalism. And, and by that, I simply mean this idea that we should just embrace all religions. Listen, when you see that bumper sticker on the back of a car that says coexist, If they mean by coexisting, get along with each other and don't kill one another, we're all for that. We're we're 100% in on that. But if they mean by that, that we should just embrace all religions and they all should be given equal status. In other words, that all truths are equal. That is baloney. Not all truth claims are equal. And religions do not agree. One of the things that Christianity stands for very dogmatically is that we have a Savior and we claim that He is the only Savior of the world. And people say, well, all religions claim that. Big deal. Not all religions are legitimate. Let's stack them up against the truth claims of Christianity and Christianity will stand head and shoulders above all of them. Period. Amen. And there's so many things we could get into on that, but you have to come to Wednesday night to hear that part. So we're going to get into that Wednesdays when we talk about having a ready defense. But why am I saying that? I'm simply saying that we as believers have been called out of darkness. We've been joined together and we as the true church of the living God. That means every truly born of God person, it doesn't matter what tag they wear. It doesn't matter if we don't agree on everything. It matters if you know Jesus Christ and He's your personal Lord and Savior. Then we're united. Then we're part of the body. Then you're my brother and sister. Amen. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. So, hallelujah. Let's go on here and um, let's look at the Scripture here. We looked at, began looking last week, and I kind of got off on a tangent, as I sometimes do. I don't very often do that, but once in a while. First, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, we're looking at what Paul said about the church, and it says, Therefore I, Paul, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. So first and foremost, what does that tell us? Well, what does the word church mean? It means to be called, called out, called out of darkness. So you've been called by God. Amen. Be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. 
Always keep yourselves united in the Holy Spirit and bind yourselves together with peace. So that's just what I was talking about, right? We need to bind ourselves together. We need to try to live at peace with one another. In the body of Christ, those who are Christians, we should get along. Amen? Amen. Verse 4, we are all one body. We have the same spirit. We have been called to the same glorious future. There is only one Lord. Who is that? There is only one faith, one baptism, and there is only one God and Father who is over us all, in us all, and living through us all. So I think that's pretty self-explanatory, right? There's no Baptist God and Lutheran God and charismatic God. There's one God, the Christian God, the true God, the true and living God. Amen? And not only the Christian God, because if I was speaking that to a Jew, they'd probably get all honked off about that. But the same God of the Jews is the same God of the Christians. And God, through the person of Jesus Christ, is uniting Jew and Christian together under one. Amen? Praise God. You you know the term Christian wasn't originally what we were called. Originally, Christians, it was called the way. Um, And in Antioch uh, is where Christians were first termed Christianity. And it was called Christians by the non-Christians, and they because the Greek word for Christ is Christos. And they go, you Christians, it's Christos this, it's Christos this. So they began to call them Christians. It wasn't exactly a word of praise. It was kind of a derogatory term toward the Christians. But that's where we got the term Christians, which I'm cool with that because we are followers of Christ. We're representatives of Christ. And uh, amen, or Messiah, it's the Hebrew term. So amen. So let's go on. Um, one spirit. Verse 7. However, he has given each one of us a special gift according to the generosity of Christ. As I said last week, now don't think of this. This, this is your gift. What he's really saying is you are a gift. He has placed a gifting within you. And going on, verse 8. That is why the scripture says, when he ascended out to the heights, he led, led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Now, what does that mean, he ascended to the heights? Well, Jesus went into the earth. He died on the cross. He descended into hell. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. Now, there's always been a great controversy within Christianity for many, many years. Did Jesus go into the torment part of hell? Because the word hell means, it it doesn't necessarily mean uh, the lake of fire and so on. The the word hell really, uh, before before Jesus arose from the dead, the, the same term for hell could be the grave. Um, And so, what happened to Old Testament saints who were right with God before they, when they died? They didn't go into heaven. Because they couldn't. There wasn't a way made for them. So they went in what's called Abraham's bosom. It's a place called paradise. And Jesus gave us this teaching that some believe is a parable. Some believe it's literal. I tend to believe it's literal. Um, where he talked about there was a certain man named Lazarus whose dogs licked his sores and he begged at the rich man's table and then the rich man, and the rich man died and went to hell and the Lazarus died and went into Abraham's bosom. And we hear the story, Jesus said uh, the rich man was in torments in flames, he was being tormented and Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom and the rich man sees Lazarus and says, send Lazarus over and so that he can dip his finger on water and quench my flames. And Abraham says, you had your good life and now he's got his rewards and you're getting your just dessert, so to speak. And besides that, there's a great gulf between us. So in that picture that Jesus gives us, we seem to get a, 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 an illustration of what this place could have been like before Jesus arose from the dead. So it tells us in Ephesians that when he died, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. It literally says that. And he preached to the captives in prison. Well, who are the people he preached to? He preached to all of those Old Testament saints that had never heard the truth of the gospel yet. He went down into the place where they were in holding and he proclaimed his resurrection. He proclaimed the gospel to them. And then it says he led captivity captive. What does that mean? He led all of those Old Testament saints out of the grave and he led them into paradise, into God's throne room. And when he led the captivity captive, he gave gifts unto men. Now, I personally do not believe that Jesus went into the torment part of hell. Although I don't agree with people, and I've read a lot of blogs and stuff by people that say, oh, you're preaching blasphemy if you say Jesus went into torment. That's blasphemy. How is it blasphemy if he became a cursed thing for us? 
The Bible says he didn't bear the curse. It says he became the curse. He became our substitute. So it's very plausible to say, yeah, maybe Jesus did go into the torment part of hell and suffer in our stead. Uh, and, uh, you know, then there's all this this convoluted fighting over words. Well, you say that Jesus was the first born again man. Well, I don't like that term born again, but he was the first man born from the dead. He was the first man that went into death and came out. Because the Bible says in Hebrews that when the father brings his first, his first begotten into the world again, he says to the angels, worship him. So I don't believe that Jesus spiritually himself was born again like we are born again. Because when we're born again, our spirit is corrupted by sin and our spirit has to be recreated. Jesus' spirit wasn't corrupted by sin. So his spirit didn't have to be reborn. So in that respect, to say that Jesus was a born again man is not biblical. But to say that he was the first born from the dead, I think is completely biblical. It's not worth fighting about. You know what? When you get to heaven, you can ask the Father if Jesus was born again or he wasn't born again. It isn't going to make one bit of difference right here now. You know, it's nonsense to fight over such stuff. Because you don't know. I don't know. Nobody really knows. And people say, well, yes, I know. They don't know. Because nobody truly knows what happened to Jesus when he died and went into the grave. We couldn't see the spiritual things that went on in Jesus' life. Amen? So, glory to God. But when he led, went out of the grave, he led captivity captive. He led all those Old Testament saints up into paradise, into the throne of God, and they were made righteous. Amen? They were born of God, and therefore, a way was made available for them to enter into the very presence of God for the first time. And then what did he do? He gave gifts to men. Well, how did he give gifts to men? Well, Jesus said, when I go away, I'm going to pray to the Father, and the Father's going to send you another comforter, a helper, one called alongside to give assistance. And the Holy Spirit, he said, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will take a mind and reveal it to you, because he's called the Spirit of truth. He's also called the Spirit of Christ. So Jesus sent the Holy Spirit by the prayers of the... He prayed to the Father. The Father sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came into the earth. And the Holy Spirit came to live in every single born of God believer. You and I have the Holy Spirit living in us. No person in the Old Testament ever had the Holy Spirit living inside of them. None. They had the Spirit on them. But not one of them had the Spirit within them. Because they weren't born again. That was not available until Jesus arose from the dead. So what an advantage the new covenant birth is compared to the old covenant. The Bible says we have a better covenant, and it is a better covenant based upon better promises because you and I have God Almighty by the Spirit of God living right on the inside of us who can lead us. You don't have to go off and run to a priest to find out what the will of God is. You can just ask the Father and he'll reveal himself to you. You can look at the Word. That wasn't available to Old Testament believers. Amen. Unless you were a king or priest or prophet. Those were the only three people that generally the Holy Spirit came upon. Amen. So we have a much greater advantage to walking with God uh, today than old covenant saints did. Well, let's go on. It says, when he ascended into high, he gave gifts unto men. He gave gifts to his people. Verse 9, notice that it says he ascended. This means that Christ first came down to the lowly world in which we live. The same one who came down is the one who ascends higher than all the heavens so that his rule might fill the entire universe. He is the one who gave these gifts to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his works, to build up the church, the body of Christ, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature and full grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature of Christ. So what's his purpose in giving these gifts to the church that he just mentioned to help us grow up? God's objective for us as Christians is to grow into full maturity in Christ. That together we would grow into full manhood, so to speak. In other words, we would grow into what it means to be a mature Christian. Amen? Measuring up. That there be unity. One of the, one of the signs of a mature church is unity. Doesn't it say that? will come into such unity of the faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature and full-grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature of Christ. So this is God's objective. One day, before sometime in, in this lifespan, uh, before Jesus returns to this earth, there will be complete unity in the body of Christ. It will happen. The church was born in a spirit of unity on the day of Pentecost, and it will leave the earth in a spirit of unity. When Jesus comes. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, But it's not going to happen by our own menagerie, our own uh, 
our own hand, our own working. You know, it's going to happen by God's hand. Amen. So glory to God. So real quickly, we're not going to spend a lot of time because I've taught on these gifts before the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor and teacher, because that's not really what I want to focus on. Uh, But I am going to teach a little bit about this because this morning we really want to get into bishops and elders and uh, deacons. And then next week, Lord willing, or as we go on, we're going to talk about the helps minister. We're going to talk about other gifts uh, that that are much more common in the body. But the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher has commonly been known as what we call the fivefold ministry gift. We call them leadership gifts. It's pretty obvious by the context of these gifts that these gifts are gifts that have greater authority when it comes to leading the body of Christ. Now, again, let me just reiterate, there's a vast difference between you being a born-again child of God and holding an office in the body of Christ. Every person, no matter what you do, is equally valuable in God's sight. There is no, nobody has a, no, an apostle doesn't have a greater worth in God's view than you do. We're all equal in God's sight. God doesn't have favorites. But when it comes to the authority of the body of Christ and function in the body of Christ, we know that the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher work in God's way of issuing authority. So what are these gifts? Well, the word apostle literally means one sent. He's a sent one. We call apostles missionaries. Well, we know there are apostles of the Lamb, the 12 apostles of the Lamb that Jesus called. They were first called disciples. Later, they were called apostles. They were sent. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that everybody abided or continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. So the apostles were basically the ones, the apostles of the Lamb called the shots. This is what we believe. This is what we stand for. And there are no greater people, no greater places of authority in Christianity than the apostles of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus said to his, you know, they asked, can I sit at your right hand? He said, that's given to my father to determine. But we know that in the scripture, the Bible talks about the sea of glass, the throne room of God, and around that throne room, there are 24 elders. Now, it's commonly believed that those 24 elders are 12 of the elders, the heads of the tribes of Israel, and 12, the 12 apostles of the Lamb, representing the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Listen, there's nobody on this planet that will sit in a higher place of authority in the kingdom that is to come than those 24. That's just the way it is. And that's fine. That's God's doing. God has the right to choose who has greater authority, who has greater status than other people. That's God. Amen? It doesn't mean, again, that we're no more valuable that we're not less that we're less valuable it just simply means that God did it you know and God can do what he wants to do amen so the 12 apostles of the lamb are the highest apostles there are now there are other apostles mentioned in the new testament we're not going to get into that this morning there are some people that believe that the role of apostles has passed away i totally disagree with that now there are only 12 apostles of the lamb but i do believe the office of ministry of apostle is very much needed today Apostles are people that are sent to establish things. You know, we have John G. Lake that was called an apostle to Africa. John G. Lake went in and started and opened up Africa to the gospel. He really did. It was an amazing man of God. Operated in signs, wonders, and miracles. And then you have the next gift of the apostle, the prophet. And the prophet is, in the Old Covenant, prophets were called seers because they saw things. They saw what God wanted Israel to do. Um, and the Old Testament prophets had greater authority than the New Testament prophets because under the New Testament, we're not led by prophets, we're led by the Holy Spirit. Under the Old Covenant, you were led by prophets. If you needed to know what God's will was, you'd go find you a prophet, you'd pay them some money, and they would prophesy. They would hear the word of the Lord, and they would say, this is what you should do. And uh, that's why under the Old Covenant, it was very severe. God said, if a prophet prophesies and it doesn't come to pass, you're to, you're to kill them, you're to stone them because they're a false prophet. The reason God was so severe with prophets under the Old Covenant is because they were the only way you could hear from God predominantly. And if they said something that wasn't of God, it could lead the whole nation astray. Now, under the New Covenant, prophets aren't in that same category. They don't have that same authority. We don't go to a prophet and the prophet prophesies and we go, oh, that must be God. I'm going to go do what the prophet said to do. That would be foolish. And there have been many people over the years that have done dumb things because a prophet said something to them. Listen, the thing you have to understand about prophecy, especially personal prophecy, 
is personal prophecy in any prophecy can be interpreted in a number of ways. And what we think the Lord is saying sometimes through a prophecy isn't necessarily what the Lord is saying through the prophecy. So we have to be really careful about taking personal prophecies that somebody speaks over our lives and go, well, the Lord said that through that prophet, now I'm going to go do it. You need to be led by the Spirit of God no matter who says what over your life. You know, I've had people prophesy things over my life many, many times over the years. Some I knew were God, some are like, I don't know if that's God or not. Well, if I'm not sure if it's God or not, this is what I do. I take it and put it up on a shelf. I'm not going to do anything about that. Because all personal prophecy is, prophecy is conditional upon your obedience to God to begin with. Just because the Lord says something through a prophet to you, it might be right on. But if you don't walk in obedience to God, that will never happen. Or if you don't change because the Lord's maybe rebuked you, that will never happen. This is the other thing. Prophets are directors. They confirm what the Spirit of God is saying. This is why when you hear somebody say something about what's going to happen in the world, and you don't hear any legitimate prophets of God saying that, just forget it. God said, I will do nothing unless I first reveal it to my apostles and prophets. That has, I believe, never changed. I believe when God is going to do something, you will hear legitimate prophets and you will hear legitimate apostles begin to talk about it. Amen? Now, this is the deal. So prophets, what's the role of prophets today if they're not in the same category as prophets in the Old Covenant? Well, we have to realize that prophets can miss it. Prophets can say stuff that is not accurate because they're human beings. So should we take them out and stone them? Should we disregard them? No. No. Because of the fact that a prophet is a man, a prophet is a woman, and they are fallible, and they don't have the same role as a prophet under the old covenant had. And prophets can be immature in their ministry, and they need to grow up in their ministry. You need, see, any ministry gift, anything you're gifted in, anything you step out to do, you have to be given leeway to be able to grow into that gift. And the thing is, you're going to understand, no matter what you do, you're going to make mistakes. The Bible says you can all prophesy. Now, again, let me just reiterate something. The prophet's ministry is not predominantly telling the future. That's what people think. Well, a prophet's ministry is telling the future. No, the prophet's ministry, I think, predominantly is proclaiming the word of God in the world. The Bible says the spirit of prophecy is Jesus Christ. All prophecies of God will always direct you to Jesus Christ. Always. By that I simply mean the focal point of all biblical, true biblical prophecy will have Christ as the center of that prophecy. Amen? So again, prophets are not called to direct us in the sense that they're going to always tell us what to do, but prophets will confirm what God wants to do in our life and prophets will speak things into our lives at times that we need to hear and heed. Amen. So I think it's a legitimate ministry to the body of Christ today. And I'm always skeptical and I always tend to shy away from people that always are talking about this cessation of stuff, that this is gone, that's gone. Pretty soon you have nothing left except an intellectual grasp of Christianity. There's no supernatural, there's no healing, there's no miracles, and there's no prophets, there's no apostles, there's no word from the Lord. You know, they say, well, it's extra biblical. Listen, we have the Holy Spirit living within us, folks. Do you think the only thing God ever speaks to your life is, oh, I'm going to speak right out of the Word of God? It has to agree with the Word of God, but just because it isn't Scripture and verse doesn't mean it's extra biblical as long as it agrees with the Word of God. But the Bible does say we're to prove the spirits, to see if they're from God. We're to search the scriptures. If somebody says something to you, make sure it's God. You know, and people say, well, uh, you know, prophets have done a lot of harm. Well, they have done a lot of harm, but people have been stupid, too. You know, I don't get all freaked out if you hear... It always boggles me that some pastors are so afraid that somebody in their church might hear something they don't preach. I think I'm a better pastor than that. I mean, I, I give you guys some credit for crying out. You're not a bunch of morons. You got a brain. I've taught you guys well. You got the sense to hear something said, so that's not the word of God. I don't like that feed. That's garbage feed. I'm going back to eat some good feed, you know? Right? 
Eat the hay, spit the sticks. You know, Brother Hagin used to always say, I have the sense of an old cow. Eat the hay, spit the sticks. You know what I mean? If you've ever baled hay, give a cow a bale. It's got some sticks in that hay. You don't come back and the cow's chewing on the hay, on the stick. The cow's got enough sense. I'm not eating that garbage. Be as smart as an old cow. Amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. So, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists. The evangelist is an awesome gift. The evangelist is predominantly, the evangelist ministry is predominantly Christ. Philip, the true biblical evangelist that we see in the New Testament, went down to Samaria and preached Christ to them. What's the focal point of the evangelist ministry? Christ. Whenever you hear the, the evangelist talk, they'll always talk about, we've got to win more people to Christ. We've got to reach more people for Christ. We've got to help people with Christ. Amen. Glory to God. He is, Christ is the focal point of the evangelist ministry. The Bible says, Paul told Timothy, do the work of the evangelist. Then we have the, te- then we have the pastor. The pastor is, could also be termed as a shepherd. Uh, the pastor is, is uh, I say the pastor's gift is a stabilizing gift. The pastor's ministry and giftedness is to bring stability to people's life. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. A pastor's anointing or giftedness will lead you into stability in your life. And then you have the teacher. The teacher is detail-oriented. The teacher is to take the Word of God and bring you the Word of God here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. Now, one of my favorite mentors, Willie George, gave this illustration as the hand for those fivefold ministry gifts. He said, you know, if you think of the apostle, the apostle, and when you hear the apostle speak, the apostle is always about, we need to start new works here. We need to do something new over here. We need to reach more people over here. That's the apostolic calling. The apostolic calling is always, there's more people to be reached. Paul was always, we've got to go somewhere else and preach the gospel. We've got to go over here and start a new church, start a new work over there. That's the apostolic calling. The apostolic calling is always seeing the big picture, going out beyond where everybody's ministering. The, the apostle in the relationship to the hand, if you could call the, the fivefold ministry gift kind of like the hand, the apostle is the thumb of the hand. And if you think of the apostle's ministry, the apostle's ministry is the only ministry that naturally supports all the rest of the ministries. Because that's what apostles are all about. They're all about helping and supporting the body and strengthening the body. Now, then you have the prophet's ministry. The prophet's ministry points the way. That's what prophets are all about. I think this is what God is saying. God is saying this to the church. That's what the prophet's ministry. Then you have, you have the evangelist. The evangelist sticks out from all the other fingers. If you meet an evangelist, evangelists are very fiery people by nature. I have never met a true evangelist that isn't a fiery person. I mean, evangelists are just, they're kind of sometimes like a bull in a china shop. In a good way. I love evangelists. They're, they're people that could get you to walk on water before you even think you're walking on water. You know, Jesus had all five of those giftings in his life. And that's why when... Jesus comes walking on the water, and Peter says, who is it? And it says, me. And he says, if it's you, bid me come out on the water. Jesus gives a big, you know, he's like a southern preacher. Come on out on that water. Peter doesn't even think about it. Because that gifted evangelist just stirs you to do things you don't think about. And he jumps out on the boat and says, oh my gosh, what am I thinking? Why did I listen to that evangelist? <laughs> That's what evangelists do. They'll get you to do things before you think about doing them. They'll get you to step out in faith and get healed, and you don't even think about it. That's why it's so powerful. You know, the, the, the evangelist ministry has more miracles than any other ministry. And then you have the, the pastor's ministry. It's the ring finger of the body of Christ because he's married to the church. He sees the church with the curlers in her hair, the bad breath, all that stuff. He sees her. He sees things that nobody else sees, and he still loves her anyhow. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Then you have the teacher. The teacher can is the pinky finger because it can fit right in your ear. Amen. So the teacher gets into your ear and he teaches you things and you know like wow that's a deep truth and where did that come from and you get teachers are like gold miners you know they open up new veins of revelation like wow where, where I never saw that before look at that that's amazing that's what the teacher does and so we need all of those ministry gifts now going on he says here in the scripture. Um, these gifts were for what? The equipping of the saints. Now, the word equipping comes from the a classic Greek word that literally means to set a bone. It's as if you have a broken bone. You go to the doctor and he sets that bone how it should be. So what are these gifts for? These 
leadership gifts, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, they're predominantly to set the body in place. That's what their gift's for. To get the body in the position that it should be in. You know, if you have a foot out of joint, if you have a broken bone, your body is going to have trouble. And what God is wanting to do through the ministry gifts is to release the ministry gifts in you and get you into the place that God has called you to. That's where you have the greatest function, you have the greatest fulfillment, and you are going to grow the most yourself is when you personally, you personally are functioning in the giftedness that God has put within you. Amen. Well, uh, let's go on. It says, verse 14, Then we will no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us uh, something different or because someone has cleverly lied to us and made the lie sound like the truth. This is the New Living Translation. I like how that says it. So, a child is always changing their mind. A child is inconsistent. A child needs to be carried around all the time. You know, those of you with babies, you know having kids, little kids, a child has to be carried. A child is someone that can't stand on their own two feet. A child is someone that can't stand in their own understanding. And we don't want to be continually forever like children. Now, we want to be childlike in our innocence, but we want to grow up into Christ and be mature when it comes to understanding. The Bible says, be excellent at what is good, be innocent of evil. In other words, be mature when it comes to knowing things of God, be stupid when it comes to knowing things of the world. Sometimes we get that backwards. We're an expert on sinful things and we don't know anything about God. You know, if you want to know what a counterfeit dollar, bill is like, study the real and you'll recognize the fake. If you spend all your time studying the fake, then you won't recognize the real. It's, and this is why I don't get all freaked out. You know, people say, oh, that's false doctrine, that's false, that's false, that's false. We're going to get deceived, we're going to get deceived. You know, if you spend time with Jesus and you stay with Jesus and you abide in Jesus, the false is easy to see. But when people don't spend that time and with Jesus, then it's like, I think this is Jesus. No, it's not. Amen? So he says, we don't want to always be, we don't want to be like children, but our goal, God's goal is for us to grow up into Christ so that we become mature and we no longer need to be children who need to be carried about. Verse 16, under his direction, the direction of Jesus, the whole body. Notice it says the whole body, not the apostle, pastor, evangelist, pastor, teacher, not just the fivefold ministry gifts, the whole body. Because God is into whole body ministry. Amen? Under his direction, the whole body is fitted together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now, let me just fill you on on something in Christianity in the West that has been very detrimental to the West. Um, what happened under the state church of England and in different parts of Europe years ago and in a lot of traditional denominational churches, not just in Europe but in other places, is there came this, this because most of the people in Europe, you know, in, in years and years ago in the dark age and so on, most people were not educated. There was not public education. Most people couldn't read. So the preachers, the priests, would read the Word of God to them. Now, this is why Martin Luther and other people, not just Martin Luther, different people, wanted to get the Word of God into the hands of people so that the common person who wasn't uh, a rich person or wasn't a priest or so on could read the Word of God for themselves and understand it for themselves. Now, part of what the Inquisition was about, one of the Inquisitions was the Catholic Church believed so adamantly that if you allowed the common person to, that was not trained in the Word of God to read the Word of God, that it would eventually lead to heresies of every sort. And unfortunately, they were true. Because since the Word of God has been put into the hands of the common person, the non-trained, uh, non-trained uh, ministry, what has happened is we've seen an explosion of distortions of every sort in Christianity. However, the Reformers believed so adamantly in the Word of God being available for every person that they didn't care, and they said, we're going to do it anyhow. And the bad part is, yeah, there have been a lot of mis- you know, just convoluted beliefs about Christianity. There's hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of different denominations and sects and so on within Christianity and so on. However, 
the positive side of that as far outweighs the negative side because if it were not for that, we would not have seen the masses and masses and masses of people all over this world saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It just would have never happened. So that was well worth it. Amen? Glory to Jesus. Now, what God wants you to realize is that you have a gift within you and God wants you to grow in that gift. And as a leader within the body of Christ, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, and teacher, our responsibility is to help you fulfill your giftedness. Now, what has happened in years gone by, and it still is around, there came this kind of shift in Western Christianity where this idea that the trained preachers, those who went to seminary, those who went to Bible school, that they became the experts in the word. Now, really, people say, well, this has never happened before. It was the same thing in Israel, folks. Not everybody went to hear, went to school to learn how to interpret. Not everybody became a priest. Not everybody became well-educated under the Jewish system either. What, what did you do? You went to a priest. You went to a trained person in the word. Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees versed in the law of Moses and all of the teachings of the Talmud and so on and so forth. So Paul was, when Paul got saved, he was naturally the most qualified person to write the New Testament, much of the New Testament we have, because he knew more than any of the apostles from the Bible than any of the apostles that Jesus chose. And that's why so much of the New Testament is attributed to Paul. Because Paul, when the light bulb came on and he put Christ in the equation, who is the propitiation for our sins, all of the dots connected supernaturally in Paul's mind and his understanding. And he understood the connection between the old covenant and the new covenant, the law and grace and the sacrifices and what Jesus fulfilled. And so that's why he wrote all of these things. He understood completely the difference between salvation by faith and salvation under the law. The law can't save you. It only condemns you. Grace and mercy came through Jesus Christ. And Paul would be the perfect person to reveal that to us. However, along with that, that understanding in Western Christianity, the problem with it is this. That Christians began to absolve themselves from knowing the Bible themselves. Well, leave it to the expert. And, you know, we have that in America. It's big time in the West because in the West, we're very into education. Now, that's a good thing. But the bad thing about it is this, that people think that if you have a, a, a name behind your name, like a Ph.D. or an M.M.D. or whatever they call it, you know, a different, different degree, that that automatically makes you an expert. But that's not true. At one time, I think it was. I don't think it's very true today at all. Now, I'm not poo-pooing education, and I'm not saying it's not good to get an education. But just because you have a master of divinity or you have a master of theology, or you have a doctorate of theology, doesn't mean you know anything. It doesn't mean you know God. Because we have preachers that lead entire groups of people and they are not even saved. They're well educated. They could quote Greek forward and backwards. They know a lot of things, but they do not know God. And what happened in Christianity in the West as we began to turn Christianity into a profession, preaching became a profession where people hired pastors or they hired preachers, and this was the idea. We're hiring you to do the work of the ministry. But that's not how it was originally set up, folks. It was set up so that the entire body does the work of the ministry under the guidance and leadership of a local pastor, under the guidance and leadership of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist. That's how God designed it. See, I only have a certain amount of giftedness. I don't have all the giftedness that we need as a church, nor does any other person in the body of Christ. There is no person in Christianity nor has there ever been since Jesus himself that has been gifted in every sphere of giftedness. There is no such thing in Christianity as someone who is an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Not going to happen. There are none. There never has been any. Now, there may be somebody that stands in more than one of those offices, one or two, but nobody stands in all five, period. And the other ministry gifts, nobody does all of the ministry gifts or God has given all the ministry gifts to you because we're all gifted and we're all designed so that we need one another. See, I need you as much as you need me. If you're not here, if you're not part of this body, then I'm preaching to the back wall. 
then my gift is a vain. It's not going to be any good. It's not. My gift in me, the gift of God that God put in me, and when I say my gift, I mean really your gift. Because when I'm talking about a gift, it's not my gift, it's God's gift to you. I am, I'm God's gift to you. <laughs> you ever hear that say, he thinks he's God's gift to women, you know? Uh, <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. That's not the inference. But I am a gift to you. I am a gift to the body of Christ. You are a gift to us. You are a gift to the body of Christ. And God wants to take that gift and help you to develop and grow in your giftedness so that the gift God has put in you can be bloomed and go out and impact more and more and more people. Amen? Amen. Well, glory to God. Well, hallelujah. Uh, Keep looking at my clock there. Let's go on this morning. We're going to wrap this up. We're just going to get into this. Again, we got through that big chunk of teaching. But this morning, we're going to just get into bishops and elders. What are bishops and elders? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So what Paul was saying to Timothy is he said, Timothy, the things I've taught you, I want you to teach those to other faithful men, who in turn will teach it to other faithful men, who in turn will teach it to other faithful men. We see in this passage... Four generations of leadership. Four generations of ministry. That's what disciples all about. Discipleship's all about. So God's admonition to Timothy, who is a young pastor, is to teach faithful men who will then in turn be able to turn around and teach other faithful men who will then in turn be able to turn around and teach other faithful men. So what do we have? We have reproduction, right? That's always been God's design. God, under the old covenant, took the spirit that was on Moses and he placed it on the twelve on the on twelve of the leaders of Israel. He placed it on seventy at one time, and they became heads of the tribes of Israel. What were they to do? They were to take the same things Moses did and reproduce them on a lower level. What God's design for the local church is to take the gift of God that is in the local pastor and then use that gift to unwrap the gifts that God brings into that local church so that people within that church can begin contributing to the local body. So that you can take what God has given you and gifted you in and use it for the maximum purpose. First Peter chapter 5, verse 1 says, The elders who are among you I exhort, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over, the, over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when... The chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So what is God telling us through Peter, the apostle Peter? He's saying to these elders, he says, to the elders who are among you. Well, what does that mean? It means an elder is, the word elder is the same word we get for overseer or bishop. It means the same thing. Now, an elder in the New Testament could be just simply an older person who has a great deal of wisdom. Now, a Christian, of course. And when Paul went and started new works, he would find an older person and he would appoint them over that work, somebody that was mature spiritually, so to speak, so that he could appoint them over that work so that they could keep things in order. Now, Peter is saying to the elders among you, being an elder myself is what he's saying, I exhort you, I exhort you to do what? Take the oversight, shepherd the flock. So an elder is a shepherd, is a pastor. Now, again, Every pastor is is an elder, but not every elder is a pastor. But an elder, by definition, is someone who takes an oversight. Now, as a, I am an elder to this church, and as an elder, I'm also a bishop. It's the same word; it's interchangeable. We use bishop in different ways, but a bishop, elder, is an overseer. It literally means someone who oversees something, takes the oversight. So my my goal, like a shepherd, that descriptive term. What does a shepherd do? A shepherd looks at his flock. A shepherd's watching his flock. A shepherd's like, well, there's a wolf over there. I'm going to go knock its head off. A shepherd's over here and he says, there's a a sheep going astray. A shepherd said, I'm going to have to take my sheep and lead them to some new pastures. I'm going to have to feed the sheep. What did Jesus say to Peter? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. What's the shepherd's predominant responsibility? What's my predominant responsibility? To feed you the word of God. That's my predominant responsibility. Amen. 
So glory to God. So he says, take the oversight as overseers, not comp- with compulsion, but willingly. In other words, not complaining and griping about it. Not for dishonest gain. In other words, don't do it to get money. Your heart has to be humility um, and so on. And be examples, not as being lords over those entrusted you, but being examples to the flock. The one thing about sheep, you don't drive sheep, you lead sheep. You cannot drive sheep. If you try to drive sheep, sheep scatter. And God uses that illustration because he wants us to lead the flock. He wants us, first and foremost, to be out in front of the flock. And he wants us to be an example to the flock. And what does it say? Be an example to those. Paul told Timothy, be an example to those who are among you. Timothy was a young man. And he was pastor in a church where most of the people in that church were a lot older than him. And some of the people in that church were eyewitnesses of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Talk about a tough crowd. They heard Jesus speak himself. And young Timothy is trying to lead them. And what does Paul talk to Timothy about? He says, Timothy, the things I've taught you, teach these to faithful men. And he says, be an example. And don't let anybody despise your youth. Don't let anybody look down on you because you're just young. But instead, be an example to people in faith, in purity, in holiness, in word, in deed. That's a shepherd's responsibility. It's my responsibility to be God's example to you. I pray that I don't ever fail in that responsibility. Now, I'm a human being just like you're a human being. And shepherds, just like everybody, can fail and and fail people. But it's still God's responsibility for me to be your example of what a Christian is to be. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen? Amen. So, Paul, or, or, or excuse me, Peter, wrap it up here. By the power of God, he says that when we do this... When the chief shepherd appears, that's why we're called under shepherd. When the chief shepherd, Jesus, appears, we will receive a crown of glory. So if I do my job the way I should, if I'm faithful to the flock of God, and I'm honoring to God, and I don't mess up my life and do something really stupid, then when Jesus appears, I will receive the crown of glory. Now, what does he tell the church? He says, yes, uh, all of you younger, submit yourself to your elders. Now, what he's saying by that, he doesn't mean just submit to older people, but it's the same connotation. What he's really referring to is if you're young in the Lord, submit to people who are older in the Lord. Submit to your elders. Submit to the pastors. Submit. See, the submission and authority is a biblical concept. It's not an American concept. It's a military concept, but it is a biblical concept. Because what comes right next to not submitting? Pride. A lot of times people, well, I'm not, tell, I'm not doing anything you tell me to do. That's because people are in rebellion. That's because sometimes people just don't want to submit. And I, you know, I'm not saying up here, you need to submit to me. No, the objective is you lead by example and people follow that example. Amen? But he specifically tells us here that you who are younger, submit to those who are over you. Those who are older in the Lord. Why? Because it's for your benefit. You know, again, using the sheep illustration, what happens to stubborn, stiff-necked sheep? They get in trouble all the time, right? What happens to stubborn, stiff-necked Christians? They get in trouble all the time. We don't want to be that way. We want to be submissive to the Lord. And the only way you can be submissive to the Lord is you have to be submissive to his authority as well. Amen? So, glory to Jesus. Well, we're going to stop right there this morning. Next week, we're going to pick up, Lord willing, and uh, we're going to get a little bit more into bishops. We're going to talk about deacons, overseers, elders. And next week, by the grace of God, I pray that we're going to get into uh, some of the other ministry gifts as well. That, And you can hopefully, through as, as we're hearing this, you can go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's where I fit. Amen? Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the Word of God. We thank you for the truth that we've heard. We pray again that these words go deep down into our hearts and that they not be stolen out of our hearts. Father, I pray for every person in, in this place this morning, every home represented here, every family. I pray that, Lord, every single one of these sheep of yours would not stray into pastures and in paths of darkness. But you'll keep them because you're able to keep what they, you, they commit to you against that day. I pray for them as this week goes by that you'll strengthen and encourage them, that you'll give them hope, give them understanding, and that you'll give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. I pray that they'll walk in the light of Jesus Christ all the days of their life and not turn to the left hand nor to the right. I pray that they will be protected by the Holy Spirit and by the angels of God that encamp about them. And I bless them in the name of Jesus.
And finally, this morning, the most important thing in your life is that you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. If you've never submitted your life to Him, I urge you to do that. I planted the Word in you this morning. Maybe I've watered the Word of God in you. And it's your responsibility to receive the truth and act upon that truth. And that is as simple as just saying, Jesus, come into my life, change me, I surrender to you. Being willing to turn from your sin and be willing to surrender your life to God. It's the hardest thing for a person to do in this world. But it is the first and most essential step in knowing God. Well, stand to your feet. Let me bless you as we go. And we'll pray over the picnic, pray over the food. Father, we thank you this morning for the food and fellowship we're about to partake of. And we pray that your grace and peace would be upon it. And Father, I pray uh, for protection that nobody does something crazy this afternoon and uh, breaks their gizzard off or something like that. Amen. Father, we, we just bless the people. We just bless them. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord make his countenance to shine upon you and bless you, grant you his peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, glory to God. Uh, we are uh, going to dismiss to go next door.